be what we call re'im ahuvim, loving companions. Then there is the idea of intimacy and the idea of romance, of some kind of spiritual bond as well. But it's a different terminology. And the reason I like that different terminology is because many of us think we're just very rational, very practical people. And love will conquer all. And especially if there are values which are not shared, it's okay because we have love. Well, what happens is we don't really function in terms of our brain. We function in terms of what I call the kishka factor. Our kishkas are our guts. Okay? When we're happy, what do we do? We have a party. When the worst day in our life happens, what do we do? We go to the refrigerator, we eat the last piece of chocolate cake. It's our kishkis which really motivate us and animate us. And so people, before they get married, say, well, we can be different religions, different values, different faith. It doesn't matter because love conquers all. We'll deal with that later. Or it's okay if we don't do this or don't do that. Best example is someone who gets married. The, 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 take an example where a Jewish man marries a non-Jewish woman, and he says, you can raise the children any way you want. Thirteen years after the, 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 the birth of the first child, he looks around and he sees, well, his brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews celebrating becoming bar bat mitzvah. His kid isn't. All of a sudden, his kishkis start up. I remember one couple where the woman had actually gone through a conversion program. And I got a call from them in the middle of December. They had to see me immediately. They had had a fist fight over what was going to be in their house for the celebration of the December holidays. And the police came and was nasty. So it was the, before the wedding and while she was going through the course, everything was fine. But when the rubber hit the road, so to speak, it became very difficult. And these things become exacerbated um, when there's a divorce because it becomes ammunition. People start shooting at each other. It's very sad. Actually, from a Jewish point of view, and we'll come back to this one, if, isn't there a, a rule, a law of a, if the, if the, it's, it's a matriarchal versus a patriarchal kind of situation? So if your mother is... According to Jewish law, one is a Jew in one of two ways. Either their mother is Jewish or they convert. So if the, if the father is Jewish, the mother is not, then we have to take that child and convert the child. Um, if the mother's Jewish, the father is not, then there's no issue. Now, the reform movement in North America has a different understanding and a different um, procedure or process, but it, it, that's a whole other show. Um, any other issues that you come across or things you can share with us um, about couples and some of the issues that the Jews, the Jewish issues that influence civil divorce? I, I wouldn't want to call them Jewish issues. I think they're just issue issues. That when people divorce, it, it brings out sometimes the the best and the worst in people, but it really eats you up in your kishkis. It grabs you right in those guts and twists them because all your dreams, all your hopes, all your prayers all of a sudden come, come, come crashing down around you and, and often get nasty and people will push the buttons of the other person. How do you handle that or when your couples come to you in that? I try to ask them to calm down a little bit, um, especially if it's a bar bat mitzvah. I try to remind the couple it's not about them. It's about the child. Um, I remember when I was in Buffalo, I had a case where the, there was such animosity between the father and the mother, and they were going to have full-blown parties against each other, and the kids were going to have to pick, and they were forcing the child to pick. And I called my office, I said, you know what? I said, I don't care what you do with the party. I said, but don't do this to your child. As you can have whatever party you want for yourselves, but don't do this to your child. Said, this is what we're going to do in the sanctuary. I said, please please, please make sure you take that with you the rest of the day. So they compromised. Instead of both having parties at the same time and the girl going back and forth, they had, one of them had it in the afternoon and one this of them had divorce. it This is a couple that was already divorced. This is a couple that was already divorced. So. And so they, the, the girl was, was, didn't like either party. She was absolutely exhausted by the end of the day. Her friends, I mean, the parents came to, what do we do? I said, send them to both. I said, for her sake, you have to. Anything different that happens in the bar mitzvah ceremony at that point, or you just treat them like regular parents? No, I try to ask the parents to remember it's not about them, it's about the kid. And the same reason, for the same way, we're celebrating a child becoming an adult. Let's be adultish about this. Well, the kids, you've, what was the children's experience on this? Point? I've had some luck. I remember once when I was in Rochester, the woman came up to me and said, um, this was a couple of days before, you may want to have the police present Saturday morning because my f husband has threatened to bring his gun with him in case he doesn't like what happens. So we called the police, we happened to be across the street, and when he came in, they actually did take him to the coat room, shut the door, had a little conversation with him, and at the end of the service later that morning, all of a sudden an officer showed up, took him to the coat room, and that was it. So what they did and what he, I have no idea, but um, what happens when these couples remarry and then there, is there, does that make any difference also? It can get 
fun. <laughs> I mean, it depends on the on the attitude of the parents. I mean, if they if if they deal well with it, if they can be adultish about it, um, which they usually can because it's a public forum. Sometimes they won't sit next to each other. Sometimes we have to change the seating arrangement in the sanctuary. But in other words, the focus is on the child. That's, and that's good. really that's important. my concern. Before I forget, part of our focus is on the, the bottom screen. So if you have questions about us or want more information about the show, there's our website at the bottom. Once again, we're talking with Rabbi Robert Eisen about Jewish marriage and divorce. And as I said, if you have any interesting questions, you want to email them to us or check our website or more information, you know, please do so. Civil divorce requires a reason. Um, historically, it was you know some kind of irreparable. The marriage is broken down. There's some kind of irretrievable breakdown, something like that now. In Jewish divorce, is there any reason that has to be given for the divorce or? Yes and no. Um, basically, the way it works is if the couple decides that they want to divorce, if the husband wants to divorce his wife, wants to let her go, he can. By Jewish law, he can. Um, and he, he writes her this safer gratuit, this bill of divorce. We call it a get. Okay? Now, a get is very, it, 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 it's a very simple piece of paper um, of 12 lines and exactly 12 lines. That way we can identify it as a get. And that comes from the Hebrew. The word for get is gimel, tet. And every letter in Hebrew has a numerical significance. Gimel is three, tet is nine, three and nine is 12. So it's 12 lines. It's written what we call lishma, that is for its sake, for her sake. And the husband has it written with her in mind. It has to be perfect in terms of the spelling of the names and the locations. And then it is delivered to the woman on behalf of the husband, where she actually accepts it. And once she accepts that get, then she's considered divorced by Jewish law. And the formula um, is very interesting, because in, in the formula for marriage is hare at mikudesh, where you say, you are now sanctified to me. And in the divorce, when we hand the woman the get, the document, we say she is now free instead of sanctified to this particular person, she's free to marry whoever she wants. So we sort of undo what was done, but we do it in a, uh, in a sacred manner. I guess that's the, the joke usually is that I'm getting a get. Yeah. Uh, is there any number? I mean, can this happen multiple times? I mean, any number of times you can get a Jewish divorce? There's no uh, limit on... Uh, no, every time. If, um, you can get married as many times as you want. want. I guess you can have a get. for Every time you get divorced, you need a get. Um, I think you sort of alluded to this, but maybe I don't know if you want to add anything to it. What, why the, Jew, the divorce is so important, the Jewish well, divorce? Well, if, if a woman does not have that Jewish divorce, if she doesn't have the get, then by Jewish law, she cannot be remarried. And I try to hold men to that same standard, uh, though the strictest reading of Jewish law might allow a man to get married again. Uh, the, uh, we, we talked earlier about me and my issue of agreeing to the divorce when uh, I got, the day I got married. But does that have to be in writing somehow, or is that just part of the ketubah? So therefore, I mean, how, does the, how do you know that the husband, that if I got divorced now, how would they know that 35 years ago I agreed to get divorced? It's a good question. Is it sometimes it's in the document, in the ketubah, the marriage license. Sometimes it's a separate uh, document. Sometimes it's just word of mouth that we know that this rabbi always had that conversation. And uh, hopefully the husband would abide by that whatever, not an oath, but that agreement which was made prior to the marriage itself. Actually, can they contest it? Can the wife, if the husband says, I want a divorce, and the wife says, no, I don't want a divorce, which is very common in civil divorces. Usually one party doesn't want the divorce. That's one of the reasons why we don't do the Jewish divorce until after. But even at that point, wife. could they still say? Uh, if she says, I've had, I have a couple of cases where women said, I don't care. It's not me. If he wants it, not me. I don't care about it. And we put um, this, actually, when I do the mediation, we will have a paragraph in the, in the, the agreement saying, yes, we agree that we'll get a, a a Jewish divorce, and then who's going to pay for it, and who's going to... There, there, are, there are conditions when the man can do what's, give what's called a get kui. The best way to explain that is a divorce that if the woman really understood the nature and the purpose and the importance of it, she would have accepted it. So we do it for her benefit. Um, and it goes to just a, the court accepts it. The court, the court, there are three people who act as what we call a bait dean, a court to... No, I wanted to ask you about that. What yeah. is it? Tell us when you uh, It's just basically just to make sure there are witnesses and everything is done properly. Um, they would accept it on her behalf, and then it goes back to the scribe. Um, and if she ever wanted to have it, all of a sudden she changed her mind, it would be ready for her. These aren't recorded anywhere. Like the civil divorces, again, are recorded in court. Is there some places is Well, all of these documented? are, the ones I do, are documented by the, the scribe I use. And